Do they understand what's going on? Do they, does it worry them or, you know, because like from my, from my perspective, right, from, it kind of depends on the company, but overarchingly, they're not that concerned enough to, you know, kind of give you like the, the, the tools, the solutions, the head count that you really need to do the good work to like actually prevent it. And there's probably a disconnect in there too, right? Like not explaining it properly, not vocalizing the risk properly. There's a whole bunch of different things that could go on with that. Yeah. I mean, look, I think the high level, I think it depends on the company and the vertical, obviously, but I, I think in general, people look at security as how they look at like insurance. Um, we need to do it. We need to have stuff in place. It's, it's also, you know, to, to some degree, it's not going to drive the, you know, growth of the business, which at the end of the day, you know, the growth of the business and the profitability is what the board is going to care the most about. So I, I think that, you know, how can you, I mean, look, what's the board going to care about? Number one, growth and profitability. Number two, they are going to care about themselves. So I think being able to help them understand how it could impact them or how it could impact leadership at the company is an important thing. And I think the other thing too is the, you know, the ROI discussion versus the existential issues of security. On the ROI side, it's like, look, if we don't implement something for, you know, XYZ the scam, then there's a chance that we're going to lose, you know, these tens of millions of dollars. If we buy this software and the software costs us half a million a year, oh, then you're going to bring down that risk significantly. The expected value is much better on the cost uh, if you just buy the software. And so I think that most companies make that ROI decision, um, which is prudent. But, you know, in addition to making that ROI decision, there is an existential issue that that sits there in the background and is very real and material that we all, you know, need to pay close attention to. And unfortunately, I think will become more real for a lot of companies. How do you think deep fakes are going to advance? What's the evolution here that you that you kind of foresee coming? Yeah, look, I, I think that we've already kind of gone beyond the era of just the deep fake into the era of like the deep fake persona. So people hear deep fake and they think, okay, voice and like this got it, you know? Sure. I think what I see is different is the combination of voice and likeness plus open source intelligence. So, um, you know, what can I, I find out about you, about your family, about your company, about all this sort of stuff that I can, because there's, there's just a tremendous amount of it now available on LLMs that's more accessible than it's ever been before. And then I can also do real-time data processing to use this vast amount of data and turn it into a, you know, realistic back and forth conversation. You know, that to me is the difference is that the, the intelligence element, the persona element of the deep fake that, that goes beyond just a voice and likeness, which voice and likeness is a very nice, nice, it's a nice thing. And they've gotten much better. You know, we do real time video versions of it now that, that are, are getting pretty good, but, but I think the intelligence behind it, that's really what's going to make these things effective, right? Like, sure didn't know what that passcode was, but you know, if I could figure out a bunch of stuff about you and make some guesses at what it is, or, you know, find some way to dig through and find that somehow, like then, then that's obviously going to, going to be the difference, but look, almost no organizations have the passcode system, you know, they should, but they don't. So that's just another example. Right. So how does ad adaptive security identify, you know, those sorts of attacks? Yeah, look, I, I think that number one, is you need to uh, spread awareness through the organization on what's possible, right? You want to just filter out 95% of the nonsense because, uh, you know, the, the really, really good, really sophisticated ones, you know, maybe they're going to get through, but we want to catch the 95% the that aren't there, right? The 98%, whatever it might be. And that comes through awareness and then process and things like that. Number two is control. So helping a company understand where are their controls missing? How can they make their controls better? What is their, you know, their control checklist to look like. So that, that sort of thing, that audit of the security controls, I think is the other missing element. What are some of the controls that you typically recommend? Yeah, no, I think that the, the passcode is obviously a, a good example of a control that should be instrumented into a number of different policies throughout the organization. Another one that I think is a big, big threat that organizations are not ready for is hiring, right? So hiring people who are impersonating someone else, often they're impersonating a LinkedIn profile, or whatever. Like how easy is it for an attacker to make a Gmail account that looks like it's Joe's Gmail and, you know, come up with Joe's LinkedIn and say, I'm this guy and I want to apply for this job and here's my resume and it copies your, your LinkedIn. And 
you know, and get on a call and it's you and they're talking to you on Zoom and they say, yeah, you know, what? we should hire this guy. And then they hire you and they give you access to all the systems and they they give you all the code and they, they give you everything. And you say, great, thanks very much. And there's obviously a tremendous amount that someone can do then with all that information. That's the one that I think we're going to see a lot of continued growth on, particularly in a world where a lot of hiring is still remote. And a lot of companies for those roles are not requiring a in-person meeting with, with the individual, right? Uh, you know, you requiring to actually meet the person, uh, you know, know that this is them. Now, of course, they can impersonate someone, which you can tell from the in-person meeting, hopefully that it's not Joe. But then number two uh, is if they make a profile that actually is that person, uh, but it makes it harder, right? Because most of these attacks are happening overseas and, you know, the person would have to come to America and they have a lot of exposure coming to America if they're doing you know, a lot of criminal things. They probably don't want to be going to America. I, I do think forcing someone to, to, to do it um, in real life is, is going to be a big thing I would implement and we implement in our own hiring process. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because I, I haven't thought about it, but I haven't gone in for an in-person interview in quite a long time at this point. There's just been not that much need for it, I guess. And companies really don't do that. You know, like even companies that I've applied for, or looked at roles for, I mean, it's just not, it's not happening. And then, you know, a friend of mine, actually, uh, their company, they were hiring someone for, for his team. And I think they hired four, it was like four or five completely fake people, like hired them, onboarded them. And day one, they realized, oh no, we got fooled, you know? No, it, it, it happens. And it's not just because the, I mean, I've had instances where we interviewed someone. I remember there was one where we interviewed a person and this is, this is, you know, it's like 10 years ago, this is before any of this stuff. We had interviewed this person and they came in for their first day, you know, and, and they were, they looked completely different and had on like, you know, had on an entirely different style and different this and that just looked totally different. And we were like, can I help you? And they're like, oh, it's this person. We just hired them. And I was like, what? So I've had that experience regardless. But yes, no, the, the deep fake thing's happening everywhere. Wow. That's crazy. I, I feel like when you have to go in person for a role, especially, I mean, to show up as a different person <laughs> takes... Well, that takes some real confidence there. I think that this person had had put on a certain, you know, as we all do, maybe in an interview process, they had put on a certain set of things and, and you know, a clothing and the, you know, the setup and everything, et cetera. And then, you know, haircut, whatever it was, then the person came in, it was like, but it was, it was crazy because none of us recognized this person as they came in and we were like, well, who's this person? And I was like, oh, it's that person. And like, oh, okay. Like, well, well, what, you know, well, they look completely different. So that was interesting. But that was different from the, the deep pick thing, which is happening, which is happening everywhere. And uh, we actually made special courses and shot special video and things like that just for training on deep fake hiring because it's it's such a very, unfortunately, common problem now. And, and I think it's just going to get frankly, it's going to get a lot worse. And sometimes it's simple, right? They just want to get the job so they, you can get paid for a bit. I mean, and then, and then, you know, and then they like, turns out they, they can't do the job or whatever it is, or maybe the person just does the job for a while. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of people out, out there impersonating someone that, you know, I just heard a story about uh, someone that was impersonating someone else. 